1863, Matthew Baird began building a mansion in Philadelphia on North Broad Street, just above Fairmount Avenue. Two years later, he became the sole proprietor of the massive Baldwin Locomotive Works, which had some 3,000 employees and churned out 400 or so locomotive engines a year. He was a great collector of art and had an ongoing relationship with the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, donating many works from his collection to various Academy exhibitions. In 1871, he married his third wife, Anna. His estimated net worth in the 1870s was three and a half million dollars, a huge fortune for that time. He died in 1877. Anna and 10 children survived him. In his career, Matthew Baird went from the plant floor to ownership of one of the greatest industrial concerns in the world. He had definitely made it. A couple months ago, my friend, the artist Bill Scott, introduced me to a painter named Pete Zebley. Pete had recently gotten out of the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, the same place I had gone 30 years earlier. Pete emailed me with an invitation to an exhibition that he and some friends were having at an old building on Broad Street. The place had seen better days, as had the North Broad Street neighborhood in which it stood. There was a woman, Karen Kunkel, who rented space in this old Baird mansion and held monthly salons in which art, food, conversation, and conviviality would be shared among a younger generation of Philadelphia artists, collectors, and curators. Okay, so Bubba protects you, but North Philadelphia can be a little bit dangerous. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been broken into? No, and I've never been attacked or harassed. I mean, there's it's pretty sketchy around here. There's a crack house on the corner. We've got, uh, this is the Transvestite Hooker Central. We've got the Hotel Carlisle a block and a half down, and a lot of halfway houses around here. But my theory is that, you know, what you give out, you get back. So if anybody approaches me, you know, just give them a good attitude and kill it, whatever their intentions are with kindness, you know. There was metered parking outside, and a guy at Karen's gave me a wad of quarters. But my meter was busted, so I left a quarter jammed halfway into the slot and hoped for the best. Well, we'll soon see if my car has been ticketed. Thank you, Karen. I was going to go. To pay her rent, Karen works as a cocktail waitress at a high-end bar. It hasn't exactly elevated her opinion of successful men. You never have the Tiger Woods effect of these married jerks coming in and... Oh, yeah. Everybody comes in. <laughs> am I right? Am I right? They put their wives in a cab about 9 o'clock and then they say, can you bring in hot chicks? Yes. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> okay, well... We're the only ones who are ever sober and responsible and make say, money. Hey, baby, how about a date sometime? We're like, really? You gonna bring your wife? You gonna... How about, your kids? Kids? <laughs> how about your kids? Are they gonna come? I found myself really liking Karen. She is a terrific artist and has a wonderful communitarian philosophy. The spirit, the old turn of the century spirit from the 1800s to the 1900s is kind of reincarnated with this turn of the century of we're trying to change the momentum in Philadelphia to be brotherly, to not be exclusive, to not be competitive, to be communicative and community. So my theory is, I just wrote an essay about this, community breeds a collective. And a collective is like the core group of the community. The people who come here every Thursday have get-togethers every Thursday. And then once a month, we have a dinner for the community that the salon breeds. So the salon community is the 50 people who show up out of the 200 emails that go out. So 50 people come, everybody who's an artist brings art, everybody who's a patron brings their opinion, everybody who's a gallery owner brings their input, 
and then the collective really comes back the next Thursday and says, this is what I did in my studio. This is how I was influenced from the critiques that we had at dinner, where everybody brings their art. The rule is that everybody comes to dinner, you bring something to eat or drink to share, and you bring two pieces of art, and we put it up on the walls, and then we have dinner, pass the salt, pass the potatoes, and talk about the art. I like it, I hate it, it makes me feel angry, it makes me feel this way, is that what you meant to do in the studio? What's your theory on space? What's your time limit for making it? How do you make it? What materials are you using? Who taught you that? What travels have you been on that influenced you? Just, just how did that art get there and why did you make it that way? I had gotten to the Baird Mansion kind of late in the day after filming for several hours at another location. I was tired and hungry and sort of overwhelmed. In 1988, I had a Toyota Corolla that was stolen in Philadelphia, and I was in a more or less constant state of anxiety that my current Corolla would suffer the same fate. It's still there. The neighborhood was indeed sketchy, as Karen put it. What I didn't realize at first was I had interrupted Karen as she was preparing for one of her monthly dinners but she was incredibly welcoming to me and generous with her time in answering my questions. I noticed a woman working on an artwork right there in Karen's living room. I uh, screen printed, and then since I have problems with my butt, I'm putting charcoal on it. So I want it to be perfect. It looks pretty good. Okay. <laughs> it's probably really all she needs to do is just get naked and stand there in real life and it'll be perfect enough. But no, Wait, I'm not that, are you the model for this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. I didn't want to do like uh, steal anybody's photography. I want it to be completely my own. So uh, I decided that I should use me. Other artists started filtering in, including Pete Sebley. That's not much blood. Try to milk it a little bit. Nah, this thumb kind of took a beating over the last couple days. Pete's uh, painting was intentionally keyed by some art hater, and now his, he's bleeding. I got... It's like stigmata for art. <laughs> PJ Smalley. I just try to paint my life, my experience, you know? I just try to be true to my experience. You know, I use Facebook. Everyone I know uses Facebook. It's just, uh, you know, a hundred years ago, if I wanted to paint my friend, I'd have them sit in front of me and model for 20 hours or a hundred hours. But now, you know, I see my friend's images in person and I see them online. So, you know, that's to make like a, a contemporary portrait just based on like what's around me, you know what I mean? Caleb Hofstein. Sometimes buy stuff. So, so sales occasionally occur? Yeah, definitely. Really? Wow. Sam Medcalf. I started to think more about printing processes and getting my hand out of the work, getting the brush out of the work. And uh, the way I did that was through stencils. So the manipulation occurs before the painting and as a different part of the painting when I move the blinds and adjust the blinds. And then after that, I'm just setting them up and using different cans of different colors over top of it to create effects that I can't observe while I'm making the work. And a guy who just might be a vampire named Skip. Full name is uh, Skirmantas Pippa. So now, say that very, very slowly. slowly. Okay. Skirmantas Pippa. Are you a vampire? No. Has anyone ever asked you that before? Yes, due to the large teeth. No, just the accent. The it's accent. The, I'm from Lithuania, not, not the... Uh, Transylvania? Not Transylvania. Yeah. Close enough, though, they all sound similar. So we're, going, we're off to Fleischer Ullman Gallery. Okay, have a very good time, and thanks for inviting me to this. Not this a problem. We're going to go support Jordan Griska, a very important sculptor of our generation, of our clique. It was hard not to think of what Matthew Baird would have made of all of this. The decline of his neighborhood, where once the cream of Philadelphia society had made their homes. The house itself, probably not as neat as once it had been. But on the other hand, I feel sure that he would have been very happy about the centrality of art in his old home. Karen told me Matthew had once been the chairman of the board of trustees at the academy. He was a self-made man who led a group of people who together worked to supply locomotives to the world. 
Surely he would be very impressed with this wonderful community of artists nesting together in his old Broad Street home.